Yes, and uh, my name is Joe Powell, and again, I am a young person in long-term recovery. And what that means is that I haven't had a drink of alcohol in 31 years now and haven't used any uh, opiates or any other drugs since January of 1973. And it's only because of long-term recovery that I am a continued advocate for recovery. Uh, and also because of long-term recovery, I'm a husband and a father and a lifelong learner and a servant leader. Um, and part of this peer movement um, that I've been a part of since 1998, when uh, SAMHSA, the federal government, decided to, to say, hey, where's uh, people in recovery? We need them at the table on the addiction side. Um, and they put out the first peer-to-peer -peer recovery community support programs across the country, and 20 of us, APA, the Association of Persons Affected by Addiction, received one of those grants for four years. And so that, uh, that's how I want to start with my introductions. Um, so, uh, in terms of affiliations, I should also note that um, I'm actually a current member of the NAMI uh, North Texas uh, Board of Directors, so it's an honor to serve in that capacity as well as um, as a psychiatrist for uh, Dallas County at University of Texas Southwestern. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into it. It's important for you all to know that uh, although this is a video platform and you see our uh, faces and hear our voices, as we go throughout this presentation, we want it to be very interactive and engaging because we feel that that is the best way uh, to present any concept and, and to really uh, explore it together. Um, so all throughout the presentation, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you, if you need something clarified or repeated, please uh, place your question or your comment or whatever it may be uh, in the chat box, Athena. Our, um, Dr. Trenum will be uh, moderating throughout the entire um, presentation, so she'll chime in um, on your behalf with the question. So if it's specific to a slide, uh, she'll come in and try to um, uh, ask the question uh, prior to the slide being changed to the next. So we encourage you guys to uh, participate along with us in this presentation. So just to give you an outline of how this is um, going to be done, uh, first, we're going to go into uh, the history of the recovery movement. Uh, this is a large portion of the presentation in that there is a robust and vast and very large history here. Um, uh, Mr. Powell and I have been able to actually approach it from um, the peers' perspective and also the consumer's perspective and then the collective's uh, perspective. So we're looking forward to showing you uh, the history in that way. Then we'll go on uh, to introduce the concept of a recovery-oriented community of care, or ROCCR ROC, as we like to refer to it. And then uh, that'll lead us into the Recovery 101 project that Mr. Powell and I both uh, put together uh, and uh, currently um, um, in process of uh, executing. We'll talk about a little bit of the preliminary results of the research that we've been doing and then next steps of the project itself. So without further delay, I'll give it over to our peer specialist and extraordinaire, Joe Powell. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Guillory. So from a peer's perspective with the history First, I've got to uh, give recognition to uh, William White, uh, mm -hmm. who is also uh, wrote the book. He wrote the book, The History uh, of um, Addiction and Recovery in America. And the name of the book is called Slaying the Dragon and by William White. And so in that book, of course, he gives, and it's a pretty thick, a pretty big book. So it gives a lot of information, even going back before 1860. Uh, but he talks about the early recovery movement. And we know that in the United States, I mean, as well, since there has been booze or alcohol on this planet, you know, then of course we've had uh, people, and especially uh, uh, what we're going to talk about now as far as uh, women um, who have started, uh, how do we restrain or moderate or stop alcohol from being a problem, right? With my family um, and with my, uh, my loved ones, uh, and definitely in the community. Uh, but definitely early in, uh, in the 1830s really is when the temperance movie, movement starts. And you see it says here, 1860, uh, recovered and recovering people working as temperance missionaries. So, and it really uh, goes back even before that, 
but the temperance movements are the women that used to come out with big old signs and maybe walk in the streets saying that, hey, we need uh, temperance. We need uh, to restrain from alcohol. We need, uh, they didn't use the term, the terminology was totally different back then. So it wasn't uh, treatment, treatment wasn't used. Uh, but temperance was the term that was used. Um, and a lot of these came also from Christian societies too. Um, and it was a, a lot of uh, uh, religious awakenings that was going on. Uh, but the temperance movements moved on until they got into also inebriate homes. And inebriate was the word where they used also for drunkard, but also for treatment. So an inebriate home, right, might be sort of like Oxford House today. But back then, <clears throat> they didn't know a lot about sustaining long-term recovery. So it was a difference. They didn't know there was a difference between initiating recovery and sustaining recovery. But the thing was, is that the JAG bosses and managers of the inebriate homes, you know, the thing was, was getting people into a safe place where they can recover. So, and then in 1906, you know, of course, it was more of how do we mix, and those are the friendly visitors within the Emanuel Clinic in Boston is where they actually included treatment and recovery together. But they didn't have a really a, a, a really a good name for it, but those were also part of inebriate homes. And in this, and it's not on this slide, but you might have heard of the Washingtonians in the Kelly Society. The Washingtonians was the largest in the 1800s, which also started in 1840. And then in 1840, they started with six members, and they really got these were six men. These six men got together, and then when the six men saw temperance, they really said, "Well, we didn't want these temperance." They said, "These, these temperance uh, people are hypocrites." They call them. And they formed their own group called the Washingtonians. And then and within six months to a year, they had over 400,000 members across the United States was from the Washingtonians. And then the Kelly group came and Leslie Kelly, Keeley, I'm sorry, they call it the Keeley group. And the Keeley Society and all of them were part of the treatment where you see the clinics and then the recovery. And a lot of Keeley, uh, there's a big mansions in Boston, um, where, where they actually had their own um, Keeley groups as far as clinics and recovery houses in Boston. But all over the United States, they was really moving. The temperance movement took off. And that's when they were the beginning of the recovery movement uh, until 1939. All the way up until 1935, I'll take that back, when Alcoholics Anonymous started, of course, and of course the big book wasn't put out until 39. But, uh, but in 1935 is when Alcoholics Anonymous started with, of course, Bill Wilson. Um, and even with his wife starting the Al-Anon group, you know, of course, it, another 10 years or so after that, she formed the, uh, the Al-Anon group. And then from that came many 12-step programs from that, um, including, I mean, they have 12 steps for groups for physicians and lawyers and everything, um, going all the way back to 1945. Uh, so, but in 1960, as you see on the slide, the paraprofessionals and alcoholism counselors, and these were uh, professionals that also were ex-addicts or people that were in recovery in the 1960s, right? Um, and even my license as a licensed chemical dependency counselor, the LCDC started from a recovery. They started, it was a recovery organization. They had certifications for people that was in recovery, and because of uh, 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 it actually went and it got, you know, with the education, they want more education and more training until actually, I mean, it, it moved into more of a license uh, credential rather than just a certification. Uh, but, uh, but even the LCDC and counselors moved from uh, the recovery. The last thing I want to say is uh, since, since Carrie is on the call too, but when you look at, because uh, I remember, uh, again, I mean, being in the field for 30 years, the Oxford House um, and Paul Malloy, who was the founder of the Oxford House, um, that I used to talk to him. And, you know, and of course, and we'd send people to Oxford Houses here in Dallas. But Oxford Houses, of course, now is the number one, of course, when you're talking about, it, it's not inebriate homes, but it's recovery houses today. And of course, and even having certified recovery uh, uh, peer specialists even, as house managers now with, with uh, Oxford Houses. But Oxford Houses, again, over a thousand houses in the United States, over 280 Oxford Houses in the state of Texas. 
Uh, but again, the recovery movement and the peer perspective on the addiction side, um, it really is vast. I mean, it is huge and the movement is just, and it really has taken off. Yeah. Okay. So now um, we'll talk about it from the consumer's perspective. And that word, a consumer, is coming from uh, the consumer movement. And so we'll talk a little bit about that when we go through the history. But it's important to realize that um, the, the peer recovery movement and the consumer rep uh, recovery movement for a very long time were separate entities. Um, it wasn't until um, the 90s with the uh, passing of legislation and the um, joining of uh, the advocacy groups that both of them came together. And it's an interesting history when that's uh, considered because um, in terms of, um, um, of mental health and um, those, uh, those things that we, um, we live with, uh, that we may take medication for, that we may seek a treatment in form of therapy for, uh, it all falls under the same umbrella in terms of uh, substance use, in terms of depression, in terms of anxiety, in terms of schizophrenia, mania, and everything in between, um, as well as around. Um, so it's uh, that's an important piece uh, when uh, recognizing the history of recovery and that it was two distinct entities from the peer, from the consumer, and then finally they came together. Um, I'm uh, quite some time later. So we'll start off from the consumer's perspective all the way in 1840 with this man named John Percival. So uh, John Percival was the son of the British prime minister at the time. Um, and he was um, uh, afflicted with uh, uh, psychotic delusions as well as uh, visual and auditory hallucinations. So what we know today as psychosis, but what um, at the time of the 1840s, uh, they knew as a death sentence. Back then, um, if you were afflicted with these things, uh, there was nothing to do with you uh, other than uh, shun you, move you away, um, uh, make, uh, make very little discussion about you at family endeavors, and, and basically wait for you uh, to pass on. There was um, no reliable medication, although lithium had been used since uh, the 1800s in Denmark. Um, it was not uh, officially used and uh, not, certainly not used in a, in a standardized format um, in, the, uh, in the 1800s. And um, the psychotic symptoms are the, uh, not the only symptoms that were seen as a death, um, as a death, um, a seal of death or a stamp of, of, of of no return. Uh, in addition to psychotic symptoms, it would be if uh, it would be people afflicted with manic symptoms or mania. It would be people that had uh, trouble with depression or uh, hysteria, as they called it, uh, way back when. Um, it would also be people that had debilitating anxiety. Uh, really, um, it boils down to anyone with what what with what we describe as serious mental illness. Uh, today. Um, they didn't know uh, what to do. They didn't know what to call it. They didn't know how to treat it. And so unfortunately, it was uh, cast off. And that's uh, the beginnings as well of uh, the big stigma that we still face today. So as you can see here, we have a big jump in time from the 18 from 1840 to the 1970s. 1840 again is with uh, John Percival first talking about this concept of recovery and uh, pretty dramatic in that time when there was no um, medication. Um, there were certainly, uh, there's certainly psychodynamic techniques that were used at the time for uh, psychosis, um, but this, this man was able to achieve, achieve a, a recovery status from psychosis um, at that time, and he spoke out about it, saying that uh, it is possible, it is something that we can do. Um, also, at this, uh, around this time, leading into the late 1800s, there was experimentation with uh, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. So that's when that uh, became popular, popularized. Um, in 1860, Emil Kraepelin, um, he was a um, German uh, psych psychiatrist. Um, he first introduced uh, the uh, concept of what we now call a schizophrenic spectrum disorder. He called it dementia. Precocia, and that roughly translates to a disturbance in cognition and of an early onset or an early dementia. And so that's how he describes schizophrenia, its very earliest form um, and very earliest understanding of what it is. And that brings us uh, into the early 1900s where ACT became a little bit more um, um, studied in terms of it was used. Um, there wasn't um, trials being executed at, at that time, but 
they were looking for anything um, to help these individuals that struggled with suicidal thoughts, with delusions, hallucinations, uh, manic episodes, uh, terrible um, struggles with depression and debilitating anxiety. So that's when that came about, as well as the experimental frontal lobotomy, which we all know um, has been popularized um, through various uh, media entities. Uh, but that was also seen as um, a form of uh, treatment, uh, very experimental, um, and now we know dangerous and not used in common practice. So it, all this is to say this is very much kind of um, gun smoke of, uh, of psychiatry, trying our best to, to treat something that we didn't truly understand very well um, and that we really didn't know um, what, what it was. Um, so very much uh, the Wild West um, in terms of uh, medical practice at the time. Um, that brings us into the 1940s, where uh, our first psychiatric medication um, was approved, and that was clomipramine. That's an antipsychotic. Um, shortly after that came the, um, the tricyclic amine amipramine, and that, that is for uh, depression. And so 1940s is really when we saw a big boom in uh, medications the first time ever that there were reliable medications uh, to be given for uh, mental, um, mental uh, illnesses, mental health uh, disorders, um, uh, the, the various diagnoses that we've uh, kind of talked over um, thus far. And so this is revolutionary because um, now, uh, if, we had, if, if they were at a place in the 1940s where they were calling it something, which means that they could definitively, you know, treat that something. It was now a matter of how well can, uh, how, how well can the individual become. Um, and this uh, also is a time of uh, a lot of institutionalization of um, individuals uh, uh, um, afflicted with uh, mental illness. And so um, there was a lot of uh, controversy uh, surrounding that, uh, which was ultimately um, uh, which ultimately led to deinstitutionalization um, in the 60s. 1963 is when uh, we had the Community uh, Mental Health Act passed at the uh, uh, at the signing of uh, President Kennedy, um, and we had this mass exodus of these individuals um, that um, that uh, basically the public was very uh, very very uh, afraid of how well they would do. Um, and it turns out that uh, lots and lots of them did very, very well. And that's when uh, the consumer movement really picked up, um, was in the, um, the, the time of deinstitutionalization, which is uh, mid, -60s to late, mid to late 60s and into the 70s. And that's what we have uh, notated here in 1970s, the United States mental health consumer movement begins. These are individuals that um, achieved uh, what we now call wellness, um, but at the time, uh, they, uh, they, um, they finally were, were called and recounted it as the good life, um, even though they were previously institutionalized, even though they uh, may or may not be on medication, even though they may or may not be in therapy, they were doing well. Now the consumer movement was very vast, so there are uh, subsections within it, uh, but broadly speaking, these were individuals that had achieved a recovery status and then began, began advocacy efforts, started speaking up about um, the uh, patient, patients, uh, those with the mental illness, um, can do better. And it's not just a matter of um, the right medication or a matter of going to X or Y amount of therapy se sessions. It's a matter of um, taking, taking ownership of your health and uh, uh, doing your best uh, to achieve a recovery status, as they refer to it. So then that brings us into the 1980s, um, where uh, we started getting proof in the pudding with the longitudinal uh, studies on recovery. Uh, this happened in the, US, uh, in the US at this time, and uh, then in other developed countries. So the US did a very, uh, um, very kind of landmark um, study on recovery and that uh, it, 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 it was proven that it is possible uh, for all um, diagnoses across uh, the, uh, the DSM. And um, that uh, allowed a lot of momentum to be gained, to be uh, garnered in, um, uh, a, a lot of momentum was gained and garnered the support of the, uh, the consumer movement. And so the advocacy efforts uh, really got a lot, a lot of, um, of, of strength, which allowed them to start really uh, 
um, advocating and lobbying on Capitol Hill. And they actually joined um, the disability um, advocates for uh, physical uh, disabilities um, and, and uh, trying to get the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act passed. And it was uh, passed in 1990. Uh, with uh, the re redefined serious mental illness, serious mental illness or SMI as disabilities, and so this was a very, very, very large uh, win for the consumer movement because this was le legislation that was passed that acknowledged recovery and and well, no, it didn't re uh, acknowledge recovery. It actually acknowledged um, that mental illness. Uh, can be uh, debilitating to the degree of uh, classifying it as a disability. I got a little ahead of myself because that brings us into the next slide where it's the collective perspective where, where both the um, consumers uh, movement and the, the peer movement um, began working in synergy together and in 1999 uh, we have the um, the uh, Surgeon General Satcher's report on mental health mandates and uh, the introduction of recovery and reco recovery oriented care. Um, so it took, you know, the passing of legislation in uh, 1990 and then nine years later, almost a decade, uh, such is uh, the, the movement and the, uh, the heartbeat of Capitol Hill for something, um, uh, something just as uh, reputable and as powerful as the U.S. Surgeon General's report to acknowledge and advance um, the the um, the agenda on the recovery movement, but it happened nonetheless. And then um, in 2008, we have the Mental Health Parity and Addiction uh, Equity Act, um, and that was passed with increased access, which allowed increased access to mental health services. And so, essentially, um, it really allowed a, a lot more uh, community support and uh, funding for those entities. Um, and then in 20, 2010, we have the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which extended the reach of uh, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And now um, I would be really, um, really um, unwise if I didn't uh, allow uh, Joe Powell to speak on these things because he was a part of a lot of uh, of this legislation um, getting passed and his advocacy efforts. So I want to clear the floor and the air for Joe Powell to speak a little bit more. Right, great, great. Thank you, Doc. But, uh, you know, the one thing is, especially with uh, the stigma of uh, mental health and addiction and how that these, uh, all the way from Surgeon General Satcher, who, uh, you know, did a great job, even culturally, um, who was specific in his uh, Surgeon General's report on mental health back in 1999, as far as even uh, being culturally congruent to different populations, uh, African Americans, Native Americans, Asians, all of that was in the Surgeon General's report, uh, which was great. Um, and he was the first Surgeon General to really have an extensive uh, Surgeon General's report on mental health. Thank you. Uh, of course, since then, we've had uh, a couple of Surgeon Generals, the last two or three Surgeon Generals, but, uh, definitely had um, on had another reports on uh, addiction, for sure. Uh, and now, of course, Surgeon General Adams is really a uh, high and has been a huge advocate for addiction and mental health recovery. Uh, but, but also with the, this Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, you know, that was so hard. And it still is, you know, they came back, and I guess it's been about, what, three or four years ago uh, with another Parity Act to enforce this Parity Act in sure. 2008 because, you know, it was like we still wasn't getting access. It mm -hmm. still wasn't equal, you know what I mean? It wasn't parity, you know, truest when it comes to uh, physical or medical uh, challenges or disorders and, and issues, you know, and while we, we're not getting the same health care on the mental health and addiction side as the medical, right? and so uh, to enforce that, and that stigma continued, you know, with that. So I think that mainly, because I remember, yeah, Washington, D.C., Faces and Voices of Recovery. I'm one of the founders for Faces and Voices in 2003, uh, where we came together across the United States and Minnesota with uh, Senator Paul Wellstone, um, and did a lot of work on there and really moving uh, addiction uh, recovery at that time uh, forward. 
Um, and we, of course, since then, if we've moved with Recovery Month and with a lot of planning partners from all over the United States, anybody, you know what I mean, that has, um, that really was an advocate or an ally of mental health or addiction recovery, uh, and then being part of SAMHSA. But all of them were advocates, I remember, with the mental health parity and, of course, Patrick Kennedy, um, who was a former con congressman, and his uncle, of course, was the president, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, but Patrick uh, was, uh, was truly on the front line with the, uh, the Mental Health Parity Act. Uh, the one that, of course, not, not so much, as much as 2008 as he was, as he was even in the second, the reinforcement of this one right here, um, just a few years ago, uh, before he left uh, Congress. So it's probably been about five years, I guess, since uh, that reinforcement act could have happened. I think um, there was, uh, I got a, a few notifications about the uh, the chat. And so I would like, um, Athena, if there's anything that you wanted to chime in from, uh, any questions or comments that may have been made? I don't see anything unless somebody chatted with you directly. I don't see anything that was addressed to anybody yet. Okay. Well, uh, I just wanted to make sure that I am going crazy. So thank you for confirming. <laughs> okay. All right. So one of the things uh, when we talk about recovery and then the history and uh, in, in America, and I, at least my experiences, um, is that working with SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration for the last uh, 22 years, you know, I got an opportunity uh, to really be a part of SAMHSA because there is the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and then there's the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, which is a C CSAP, they call it, and then CSAT. And then you have CMHS, which is a Center for Mental Health Services. And so working with, uh, with all three of them, um, up with SAMHSA, and I was on, uh, had the opportunity to be on the Wellness Committee with uh, Mary Ann Copeland, um, and Bill Anthony. And here on this slide here, Bill Anthony or uh, William Anthony, he's the director of Boston Center for Psychi Psychiatric Rehabilitation in 1993. But, but Bill was, I mean, was a serious and a true advocate uh, as a psychiatrist, did a lot of work. I mean, I mean, he is great. This is just one of the things, one of the uh, slides uh, that I was able to, to pull off just to show uh, what Bill said about recovery. So recovery is, is a deeply personal, unique process of changing one's attitudes, values, feelings, goals, skills, and all roles. It is a way of living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even with limitations caused by the illness. I like that. Even with the limitations caused by the illness, we still can live this satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life. Recovery involves the, the development of new meaning, new meaning and purpose in one's life as one grows beyond the catastrophic Ill effects of mental illness. You know, in this right here, what I love about this too is that it actually gives you a perspective that how any and anyone can be in recovery. My younger brother, I'm gonna give as an example, because he was smoking marijuana at 13 years old in New York and I grew up in all of New York, but at 13 years old, and I remember at 15 is when he started, uh, of course, we didn't know what was he talking about, you know, and then it was, you know, when he was delusional or it was, he would make up stuff and he said he was seeing things and it was hearing uh, voices, et cetera. Uh, and of course, we didn't have a clue what was going on. Uh, you know, and then of course it got to the point where he had to be hospitalized. And you know, he was hospitalized for 30 years in Manhattan Psychiatric Hospital, 30 years. Now I've had, since I've been in this field, of course, for the last, at least for the last 30, 31 years, going on 32 years this year. Uh, and most of y'all know that when I got sober 31 years ago, in October, it would be 32, but the guy that was in the meeting that was became my 12-step uh, sponsor was a psychiatrist. Now, I didn't know he was a psychiatrist. They just told me, you need to ask this somebody to help you. You need to ask that guy over there for help. And I said, ask him. He said, yeah, just ask him to be your sponsor. I said, 
I said, what's the sponsor? Don't worry about it. Just ask that old dude over there. And uh, and when I asked him, you know, of course he said, yeah, he said, call me at, you know, we didn't have cell phones then. He said, call me on my pager, call me at home, and then call me at these two hospitals. Call me at these two hospitals. Now he really scared down full of fear. You know, who is this guy? I call him at the hospital, you know. And of course I said, yeah, but then I caught the guys on the way out and I said, who's this guy? He said, oh, that's Dr. Deer. He's a psychiatrist. Oh, no. <laughs> it scared me, you know. And of course I ran and got me a drink of alcohol quick right after that. <laughs> Took me a couple of weeks to surrender totally, you know. But the thing is, is that this slide reminds me, though, of my little brother, though, because today he's in a recovery house in the Bronx, New York. And he's still, I talked to him just the day before yesterday, and he's still very delusional, but yet in his own way, but he's still, he's in his own recovery. You know that they can leave where before coronavirus, he was able yeah. to get any subway train, he can go out and walk, go wherever he wants, and guess what? He come right back to the house. And they have 40 people in this building, and all of them have schizophrenia. And so to see something like when I go around the block and go see them, they all outside passing around cigarettes, you know, and that's recovery to me for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they still can still enjoy, like it says here, what Bill Anthony says here as far as satisfying and hopeful. You mm -hmm. know, he didn't have to be in the hospital. <laughs> uh, one more example I want to give of recovery, though with this right here, uh, it was, uh, and some of y'all know, I know Patty, you know, Dan Fisher. Dan Fisher uh, was over the, uh, the, what was it, the Empowerment Center. Uh, and so, uh, and the Empowerment Center out of Washington, D.C., and Dan is also a psychiatrist. I think Dan is a psychologist. I'm not sure if he's a psychiatrist either, but he also has schizophrenia. And I remember in 2002, when the Institute of Medicine they called a bunch of us together to Washington, D.C. It was about 100 of us. And so uh, and it was all physicians and people that worked in the field, high level people. And so we in this big ballroom, you know, 100 or 200 of us. And Dan was the one that was supposed to introduce. So Dan gets up to the mic. And of course, when you're in a ballroom and we could all hear some music coming from next door, you know, and it was faint. It wasn't that loud. But Dan gets up to the microphone, and the first thing Dan says on the mic is, does anybody else hear this music coming from? And everybody started laughing because most people know that Dan has, you know, schizophrenia. And he's, and so the thing was is that we all heard it, and we all laughed and said, yeah, Dan, we all. But you see how he connected support. He connected to the, you know, matter. he was 100, 200 people, he still asked and said, hey, anybody else in this, you know, to me, that's recovery. When you can, you know, be, can check in and connect with somebody else, you know what I mean, and, and let everybody know, hey, uh, you know, we all peer, you know, that's peer to peer right there. And uh, so I really love that. Uh, and I always, I'll never forget that right there with Dan did, and with Bill Anthony and all of these guys. So, thank you. Well, I think that, really leads uh, well into the next uh, slide, which is uh, the recovery components. And so um, both examples, I think, were very, very great um, in that uh, all six components were within them. So um, uh, Joe expressing um, the story about um, his brother, where he's in, a, he's connected in the community where um, he does have a sense of hope and, uh, uh, I mean, optimism to be able to go outside of the um, of the house that he lives and, and feel comfortable to uh, walk around wherever he wants. And uh, he certainly has a sense of identity in that he knows where he belongs. He knows um, what's good what's good for him and maintains it to the best of his identity and that um, to best of his ability. And that brings a lot of meaning and purpose and empowerment. And um, that's a, a, a really one, wonderful with this, uh, tying in of uh, that the professional because he leads the the empowerment house that you said, yeah, that organization's name and and uh, that's uh, rightfully yeah, named mm -hmm. the empowerment center. Thank you. Um, that's rightfully uh, labeled because that is uh, certainly an essential component um, of uh, recovery. And so that's what um, 
uh, this slide is uh, just giving you another um, explanation of recovery and how we see it. So we're about to move on to this uh, concept of recovery oriented community of care. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, if anyone had any questions about the history of the recovery movement, um, recovery as a concept as we just um, went over it, we, uh, we encourage uh, those to happen. Um, um, but if not, then we'll just proceed as follows. So um, I'll let Mr. Powell discuss the rock and the rock. Yes, sir. So again, going back to SAMHSA, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, I see that we got the, uh, yeah, that's right. No, oh no, there's an extra S there. That's what I see that. Yeah, that's why I SAMHSA. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no uh, so SAMHSA, again, was the one that uh, implemented uh, ROSC. Uh, and the ROSC, again, Recovery Oriented Systems, again, this really goes all the way back to IOM, the IOM, the IOM the Institute of Medicine, I think, uh, when they put that out. Um, and the, uh, the director of SAMHSA and Health and Human Services and all of them. And they said that they wanted every state in the United States need to be using toward, moving toward a recovery oriented system of care. So every state in the country has really had been challenged with this to really to move toward recovery. Um, and so this right here, of course, when we talk about is a, it's a, you know, it's a framework for coordinated uh, coordinating multiple systems and services and supports that are person-centered, self-directed, and designed to readily adjust to meet the individual's needs and chosen pathway to recovery. Uh, the system builds upon the stress and resilience of individuals and families and communities to take responsibility for their sustained health, wellness, and recovery from substance use disorders, and definitely in mental health also, uh, with an improved quality of life. So a ROSC, okay, is something that where we can come and we all will be on the same page and the same goals and align these systems throughout uh, the states, right? The state of Texas, for instance, the state of Texas right now, we have 28 cities. And I think we just lost a few cities uh, to this, but we had at least 28 cities we had last year that was doing ROSC meetings. And so in every city, there's like, do you bring in people together uh, for to talk about recovery-oriented communities of care or recovery-oriented systems of care? How do you bring these systems into a recovery alignment, right? Uh, and for quality of life. Uh, but that's where the ROSC actually started with. And still today though, they, they have not perfected or they still have not really even moved that needle when it comes to making a community or a city a recovery oriented system of care or recovery oriented community of care. And that's where the rock comes in at, as far as recovery oriented community of care. Because you know that's pretty big to say that we're gonna have a Ross in Dallas. And we know that Dallas has over what two million people now you know, in the city of Dallas. So just to, how do we bring, we move two million people toward health, wellness, and recovery, right? And that's gonna be a big, so one thing I always say, just like an elephant, one bite at a time, or either maybe one zip code at a time, or one community at a time, mm -hmm. right? And that's where we get into a uh, rock. So the extension of, of a ROS that focuses on the community's role in a person's acquisition and maintenance of recovery from mental health disorders. So again, we want to align definitely in our community. And the thing is, is how do you bring everyone together? I think that in our community, it's sort of like working with NAMI, you know, or a metro care or, or recovery advocates, right? We, advocates need to be at the table when we look at a recovery oriented community of care. People in recovery, how do we get, uh, welcome uh, Oxford houses, you know what I mean? And how do they play a part in the recovery oriented community of care? Because we know that uh, even though there should be the Oxford house, I mean, you mentioned them, of course, they're all over the world that Carrie said. So they are, you know, they can, they can actually, but they haven't really been invited yet. And, and we really haven't really brought them on uh, just like as 
with, with NAMI. NAMI, of course, is huge. NAMI has been around for a long time. And uh, being one of those founders of NAMI in South Dallas 20 years ago, too, uh, Southern Sector. But the thing is, is that, you know, NAMI was always an advocate and educator and awareness uh, uh, for, for, the, for the really, the, I know in the United States, and I'm sure it might have been all over the world, but the oldest in the United States. So this is where the recovery-oriented community of care. How do you bring the community, though, in and, and educate the community, of course, and support the community, right? Bring awareness about mental health and, you know, and substance use or co-occurring uh, disorders, uh, you know, to light. And that brings us to the Recovery 101 project. So um, I believe now over a year, yes, well, well over a year, Mr. Powell and I uh, came in contact and talked about this uh, concept of recovery. What does it mean? Where does it come from? How deep does it go? It turns out it goes very, very deep. Um, how, how do we uh, approach uh, this, um, this, this thing that deserves respect, deserves acknowledgement, um, but certainly um, deserves a lot of uh, recognition. Uh, and we feel that uh, the empowering quality of anything is when uh, knowledge is received um, and when knowledge is gained and then it mobilizes an individual to be able to um, to utilize the power that comes with uh, that that uh, the education and so uh, we felt that we should uh, create an education program an education curriculum we didn't know what to call it and so uh, <laughs> ultimately we decided to call it um, uh, recovery oriented education and we targeted um, a very deserving uh, population, a very deserving uh, community and that's the South Dallas Fair Park community. So um, we're all familiar with it um, and I'm not sure if you all, all are familiar with the study that came out from UT Southwestern of average life expectancy across uh, across the uh, counties, but then also within uh, Dallas County. And it showed that Fair Park average life expectancy was 65.5 years. And that is uh, in relation to the national average, which is 78.6. So um, just for, you know, our uh, math, uh, uh, our uh, math uh, deficiency, deficiency uh, out there, that is more than a 10 year loss. That's uh, 13. Uh, years, almost 14 years, uh, just because you uh, born, grew up, you're living in Bear Park, and then the te Texas average is 78.5, so again, that 14-year uh, loss of, uh, of years, uh, and then Dallas County is 78.3, so dramatic uh, decrease in your, um, in your uh, lifespan just by uh, where you are. And also um, that study was showing that um, another study uh, shows that nearly 1,000 adults in Fair Park receive mental health or substance use treatment. So a large percentage of the individuals uh, there are uh, very much um, not just uh, aff afflicted with um, um, like health uh, issues, uh, food shortages issues, a lack of, of resources, um, lack of financial stability, but a big piece of it is exactly what um, we're passionate about, which is um, recovery, and because there are individuals that are potentially um, capable of achieving recovery. Um, so why don't we start there and trying to educate them? And that's when we developed our community psychoeducation program project, and we called it Recovery 101, because we're starting with the basics and uh, we're gonna go from there. So from the uh, project, uh, we had various components that I'll let um, Joe Powell talk a little bit more about. Right, so from that, again, uh, we talk about how do we create it, uh, the psychoeducation program. Um, and again, we actually is divided into these four components. I think it's, let me say one, two, three, four, and it's five components, that's right. So one, of course, addiction, mental health, treatment and recovery, advocacy, uh, and rock stars. The rock stars went with their advocacy piece and then recovery support, which brought up, talked about the resources in the community. So wherever that we are, what resources do we need to, uh, that community need to learn about and connect to so they can move toward health, wellness, and recovery. Our, our lectures was given by our certified peer specialist at APA. So, mm -hmm. We have six volunteer 
peer specialists, uh, and those guys did a great job, you know, um, and they receive, of course, additional training them, themselves from me and Dr. Guillory, uh, and to make sure that they are, did great jobs as far as presentations and presenting the content and with their effective presenting styles. So it, it was, a, this is how, this is just the project components there and how we got started and where we are now. Yeah, so uh, essentially what we created were two different education uh, platforms. So the first was a weekly lecture series uh, re entitled Recovery 101, a five-part series. So it, was, it goes over the course of five weeks, um, and it's one hour uh, lecture each week. And this happens as a regularly occurring um, 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 education. Uh, so every week at uh, APA, which um, Joe Powell is the president and CEO of. And uh, it's in a classroom layout with a projector, so very much kind of lecture style, um, but um, it's led in a very kind of group-centric way. So it's kind of around, everyone's uh, circled up. Um, it's very kind of open. Um, the groups are a lot more uh, intimate in the number, uh, and then also in the way that the presenters present uh, the material. It's much, much more uh, kind of audience-driven pace uh, as opposed to just kind of uh, driving through slides. Um, and it occurs on Saturdays and Tuesdays, and we, we figured out that those were uh, just good days to have it on Saturday uh, mornings, um, and then a Tuesday um, morning and a regularly scheduled uh, uh, slot uh, at APA. And then the next uh, um, component or the next um, uh, psychoeducation um, um, presentation uh, was entitled, is entitled Recovery 101, How to Become a Rock Star. And so uh, basically this is uh, co contextually um, and um, content wise, it's the same as the five part series. It's just condensed into um, a four hour lecture. So it's um, all of it in four hours. So boom, boom, bam, <laughs> getting it uh, all done in one session. Um, and uh, the, the reason why we made it uh, and we crafted the lecture in that style uh, is because we are taking this presentation and giving it all over uh, the uh, Dallas County uh, and various communities, including um, the communities that uh, NAMI um, is uh, directly uh, involved in. And so we'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, so uh, the interesting uh, thing about this uh, uh, presentation um, is that uh, our presenters, uh, we decided that the ones that have given enough presentations, uh, the weekly series, um, the season, the tenured, um, are the senior level of Recovery 101 presenters are the ones that actually come out with us um, uh, outside of the, um, the community that we are based in, which is Fair Park. Um, um, community um, and uh, they they present so uh, essentially we uh, we take our uh, our uh, our best our best and our most seasoned uh, to uh, go out into the community and uh, do our best uh, to introduce the concept educate on the concept and move hopefully move uh, and shift individuals to be more um, more engaged in their own recovery more motivated to achieve recovery and or open about talking about um, recovery. So that brings us into the research. Um, so um, essentially um, the, uh, the background um, of the project is uh, that there is actually no prior recovery oriented community psychoeducation um, program, project, education um, period. Um, and so Mr. Powell and I saw a real opportunity here um, to uh, get uh, again, um, a lot of, uh, not a lot of, but uh, uh, more evidence on what we're doing in that, uh, is it effective? Is it helping? How is it helping? Um, and I'll uh, let uh, Mr. Paul talk about the aim and the methods. Yeah, actually, before you go on, I do have a question from Patty. Um, I think it probably came when you were talking about more about life expectancy, but I wanna jump in there. She says, what about the loss of life 25 years earlier than normal if you have a mental to health condition. So how does that relate to um, the statistics that you were presenting earlier? 
Right. So um, the this the stat that you're referencing, um, Patty. Um, so that is a statistic that is was basically taken from a, a study that's uh, older than the one that's specific to the the Dallas County, um, and it wasn't specific to Dallas County. So that statistic is true. Um, is that there is um, a considerable amount of years lost just because you have a mental illness on board. Um, it's just that as more evidence and more research has come about, um, quantifying it has kind of shifted over the years. So it doesn't mean that um, Fair Park is just afflicted with mental illness. There are lots of uh, what we call social determinants of health that are at play here. And one of the pieces is uh, the mental health uh, needs that are going unaddressed. Mm -hmm. And that's also, uh, I forgot when that came out, Patty, you probably know uh, when that came out and uh, they said that, again, that mental health, uh, people with mental health uh, live 25 years uh, short uh, lifespan, shorter lifespan than, uh, than the regular population. Uh, and I remember that, I mean, that, that haven't been out for too long. I don't know, I know it was within 10 years that, they, that, that, that that came out. Uh, and everybody across the country got that. Uh, but also, but I think with this project and our research, the aim is is to increase understanding, uh, and even understanding of that. You know, what does that mean as far as all of the uh, the issues and challenges that go along with mental health uh, conditions, as well as addiction, right? Um, but an increased understanding. We get a we always get a lot of good conversation too when we do our uh, our trainings, right? And especially since they are community based and peer based. Uh, then there's a lot of good dialogue, but also the uh, the aim is to increase the awareness, uh, participation, and utilization of mental health recovery uh, resources throughout the community uh, and with the community uh, psychoeducation project. So uh, that our aim is really at the community, right, and making sure that people do understand, get this awareness, get this education. Uh, because, like we said, we saw the opportunity because not a whole lot is, is, is being out there to the community. And again, for me, I never do, since we're, I've been doing this, you know, we don't wait on anyone. You know, we go wherever people are. When I started after, it was wherever people are, we know addiction and mental health challenges are there. You know, and that's where we want to be, whether it's in the jail, prison, the church, you know, wherever in the community people are. We know mental health and addiction is, so we don't wait. We need to get out and promote recovery. With the project here, of course, our methods was the survey. We also had to get this quantitative and qualitative analysis that we need and, and, and outcomes that we wanted to see. We did a pre and post uh, surveys, uh, elective surveys. So that means that you know before and um, before we did the present, before we do any of the trainings, before we do any of the education, everybody gets the, uh, the pretest and they were complete so we can see exactly how much do they know, or how much did they learn after they do, when they do the post test, you know? And so again, so a pre and post test is done. So, um, and Doc, uh, Dr. Guillory uh, with UT Southwestern uh, Medical School and the, the research project, um, they get a chance to really to analyze this uh, this data uh, to see what is the, the qualitative and quantitative measures on that. So let's get into some of the preliminary results, and they're preliminary in that uh, the project um, it, it was launched in uh, July July of 2019, and it will go until the end of June. Um, I'm sorry, June 2019, and it will go until the end of June uh, 2020. So um, when, when I took this snapshot, we had five cycles of the five one-hour weekly sessions done, and we had uh, 190 survey entries collected. So the quantitative analysis uh, showed that in, in terms of, of awareness of recovery and knowledge of recovery, the presentations were significantly associated uh, with increased awareness and knowledge. So we we're very uh, proud of, of that fact. And then in terms of the qualitative, analysis, uh, all the participants at the end of their post survey, uh, they essentially had a question that prompted like a free response and it said, what did you gain from this session? Very open. Um, and these are some of the, uh, the quotes 
that they uh, said. And so I'll just read them out because we, uh, we really uh, thought they resonated uh, with us and kind of the mission that we have uh, with the project. So I've, what I've gained from this is how to maintain and stay focused on my recovery. Eye opener of all the resources available here in Dallas. I've gained knowledge on what recovery is and how important it is to have a healthy support system and keep a good mental health and have a positive group of people in your life. I learned a lot about community services that can help an individual learn about addiction and mental health awareness. Very enlightening and great presentation. Advocacy is very imperative and necessary. And uh, one of my favorites, removing the shame and the stigma. So um, I'm sure you're asking yourselves, how do you become a rock star? And I think that's a very valuable and valid question. <laughs> so we'll tell you. Mm -hmm. All right. So upcoming presentations, true. So for you to be a rock star, one is that these are upcoming rock stars here. I mean, NAMI, you guys are already rock stars. I mean, and they've been rock stars for a while. And I think that um, uh, Dr. Athena, <laughs> uh, she's going to make sure that we continue, of course, these presentations. And of course, we, it looks like that we have an upcoming NAMI North Texas uh, presentation, uh, April 24th, from 1 to 5. And then we'll see, we'll get to uh, do the whole presentation. And that's one way uh, to become a rock star is to get the whole education. Um, and so this is a four hour education that's coming, it's gonna be interactive. Uh, and of course it will be a virtual news meeting. I'm sorry about that, uh, but it will be a virtual meeting, um, which you still can get the education and see all the, get all of the recovery one-on-one -on -one components to it. And of course, when we are doing, we're looking forward also to continue to work also with Metricare and to have uh, presentations in May of this year. Uh, one at the Lancaster Peace uh, Clinic, as well as the uh, Skillman Clinic. Uh, so these are upcoming opportunities to be a rock star. Uh, so we look forward to, to seeing you guys, at, hopefully at the NAMI on the 24th. Yes, yes. And, and please um, uh, share uh, the date. Um, and um, you can even uh, uh, schedule a simultaneous watch party all together in the comfort and safety of your own respective homes. <laughs> Do not get together. <laughs> Stay in your home by yourself, um, but connected with others on uh, the upcoming Friday, April 24th uh, date. So um, we're at the end of the presentation. Uh, this is just our references throughout in case you were curious. Um, again, we wanna thank you so very much for your time and sharing it with us and um, really uh, investing in yourself with um, looking uh, to educate uh, more on recovery, um, hearing us out. Uh, we thank you for that and we would love to take any questions.